Hi, <laughs> I'm Maria. My name is Kaisa. And as Krista said, we are here today uh, because of the topic taboo, which is uh, a very dear topic to us. Because uh, ever since we started our own thing, we have kind of, in whatever we do, we try to at least push the world towards a little bit more of an equal place. Um, and we are firm believers that we can't make equality without breaking a few taboos. And we are going to dive into one taboo in specific today. Uh, because, well, the taboo that we are going to talk about is the pussy and everything around the pussy. Did you say? The pussy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because at the moment... <laughs> We feel there are many taboos we need to break in order to reach equality, but this is an urgent one. And why is it urgent? Because at the moment, there are decisions being made, <laughs> politics being laid, that deeply affects women with pussies, or people with pussies, I'm going to say. And these decisions drastically limit the lives of these people with pussies. And the decisions are being made by a bon bunch of racist, misogynistic idiots that don't even have pussies. Okay. So, with that said, uh, Kaisa, I'm looking at you and I see that you're breaking quite a few taboos right now. Uh, I guess you could say that I am. Um, I mean, we don't usually use the word taboo that much anymore, but what we mean when we say taboo is what's normal and what's not normal. I mean, taboo is about norms, really. Yeah, so just to be a woman can sometimes be a taboo, or a non-male, for that matter. Um, to be a woman on stage can also be a taboo. To be gay can still very much be a taboo. To be a gay woman on stage, oh my god, yes, tabooing, tabooing. Uh, to talk about the pussy. Taboo. Yeah, okay. To be a gay woman on stage talking about the pussy. Check, 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 yes. check, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but, I mean, today is all about... I mean, we want to do this because talking about the pussy is reclaiming power. Um, power that connects people and power that feeds creativity. Yeah, exactly. We're going to dive deep into the world of the pussy. Uh, a nice, warm, comfortable place. But first, just to set the mood right. Let's get nasty. Yeah. Fast, die young, bad girls, do it well. well, 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 well. Oh, okay. Like we said, it's an urgent matter. It's an urgent taboo to break, but it's also about bloody time. Because this, my friends, is not an alternative fact. We know so little about the pussy still. Um, how many in here knows the difference between the penis and the scrotum? Okay, we have more work to do than I thought. <laughs> but what about the vagina and the vulva? Yay! Pussy friends! Uh, there's usually a bigger difference. Maybe you weren't... Or well, maybe it is that situation that we need to talk about the penis and the scrotum as well, but we think we do that often enough. Anyway, the vulva are the outer parts, the vagina is the kind of canal through which life passes. But we are going to use the word pussy a lot today because that kind of covers it all. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I am so curious now, Kajsa Skedevin. Mm -hmm. What's your vulvaginal story? <laughs> to answer that, let me take you back uh, 25 years in time. Uh, I think I'm 12 in this picture going on 13, and I remember this was around the time the first 
times that I started hearing about like uh, that I wasn't good enough, that my body wasn't good enough, and uh, in specific that this area wasn't good enough. I mean, magazines and advertising and society told us young people to alter ourselves to please others. I mean, okay, shaving and trimming, that's fine, but I mean, perfuming and then surgically altering your private parts to please Bleaching. others. Bleaching. Huh? Bleaching. Bleaching, yes. Vajazzling. That came later. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it was, uh, that was painful to me and I think to a lot of people in my generation, or this list, I mean, uh, so that's, that's, well, it just made me feel bad about myself. I felt that I wasn't good enough. But then, uh, as I grew older and I met friends and I started talking about all these things, I realized that there's nothing whatsoever wrong with me down here. I actually have a powerhouse down here. That's what I realized. So, to kind of to prove our point here, yeah. did you feel like it helped starting to talk about your pussy in order to feel better? Oh yeah, it so did, it so did. Talking to people, yeah. What about you, Mary? Well, in my case, it was a bit more of a Lord Voldemort situation. Don't mention it by its name. Um, there was no name for it when I grew up. I had no name. I think I had no. I, I didn't know what what it looked like. I'd never seen it until I don't know when. I think in my in my uh, mid late teens, early twenties, other people had more of a relationship with my pussy than I did. Uh -huh. um, it was just nothing. But that was ages ago. Water under the bridge, right? A lot of things have changed. Uh, or <laughs> enter the blessed state of pregnancy. There comes a time in many uterus carriers' lives when it's time to think about should I fill this uterus with life and kind of do my part to keep this thing called humanity going for another generation, or should I not? I decided to do that seven years ago for the first time. I was, I went pro-life. And, uh, <laughs> and being pregnant, that was basically the first time I really encountered the Swedish medical care system. Mm -hmm. And I had so many questions. I had questions about babies, of course, because it was my first. Like how to, how to feed them, how to like keep them safe, make them good people. But I also had questions about my vaginal recovery. Because even though I hadn't given birth before, I had a hinge that, uh, I mean, having something that big as like three, four kilos coming out of me, I never had that big of a thing coming into me. So I, I imagine that if, if I'm gonna be able to do like a vaginal delivery, something's gonna happen down there. And I had questions about that. And it was so, funny, <laughs> but all the questions I had about babies, I was giving many, many answers to. I was properly well informed. Mm -hmm. But all the questions I had <laughs> about my vaginal journey up post-birth, it was left with like this silence. It was Lord Voldemort all over again. And that was sad. And, but it's hard to kind of go back once you have the baby in you. So I had to do it, and uh, 40 hours later, a good work week of a birth, uh, this <laughs> lovely person broke into the world, and so did my pussy. It <gasps> broke. Uh, it had to be stitched uh, for two hours. And uh, the day after, I, I was curious. What's it gonna be like? What has happened? Let me see. Um, no, I was actually afraid the day after. I was afraid to, to kind of put my hand there and, and feel, I mean, check the damage. Mm -hmm. But I did, and I kind of stroked it, and I got this weird sensation. It was like, it was like, 
Yes, one of those, you know, pork loins with net on it. Kassler, you say in Swedish. Um, it was bulky and it was stitches and it was all bubbly and it, it, it fucking hurt. And I wish someone would have told me about this, that that could happen. After like a normal thing as like passing on the life to keep humanity going. Oh, because, it's a miracle. <laughs> because this is such a common thing. Every other person who gives birth vaginally will have a rupture that will keep that person from doing things such as peeing, pooping, sit. sitting. Yeah. Like quite a, like essential things. Sexing. Sexing, God. I, no, no. What are you even talking about? No, no, I mean, that's no. like <laughs> so far out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and one in 10, one in 10 gets one of those total ruptures, which means that the wall between the rectum and the vagina is damaged. And half of those people go untreated because this is something we don't talk about. And then you can end up with anal pockets. Do you know what anal pockets is? Because we don't talk about this, but it's a common thing and it hurts people. It's an unnecessary suffering because we don't talk about it. Anyway, you don't have to look at this anymore. <laughs> Let's move on. Because a few years later, when I ended up at a digital agency here in Gothenburg, and I met this one, I thought that I had a chance to sort of redeem myself or start breaking these taboos that I had found that really led to unnecessary suffering. Because I was uh, by then a copywriter uh, at this agency mm -hmm. and I was involved with, uh, in a pr global project with a big, huge client in the incontinence industry here in Gothenburg. Um, Does everybody know what incontinence means? Excellent, because one, because <laughs> a third of you is going to experience it firsthand. So that's good. Be prepared. Um, this is also such a common thing, and uh, I was so happy to like dive into this work um, because the client's approach was that we want to break taboos. We want to normalize the condition of incontinence because it is such a common thing, and. Uh, I was like, yes, I want to do this with you. And this is excellent. Because by then I had had uh, two vaginal births and uh, was incontinent myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, hi, I'm in the work group. I'm in the target group. I know this. I want to break taboos with you. Let's go. <sighs> and, then <laughs> and then the saddest thing happened. Because even though this like, major corporation had the approach that they wanted to break taboos. Mm. I realized quickly, <laughs> one of the first meetings I sat down with them, I realized that they didn't really want to break taboos because when I started talking about my own incontinence and my experiences, they couldn't even look at me because <laughs> they were so embarrassed. <sighs> and they just ended up going with this approach. Kajsa, <coughs> can you tell me what we're looking at here? You're laughing. This is like totally authentic. No, I mean, these are mock-ups that we did prior to this presentation because, I mean, we don't want to name any names of all clients. We're not that nasty. Uh, but they're, they're very true to life. Very true to life. Very, very true to life. What we're looking here at here is, you could say, two ads uh, with uh, two very different creative approaches to the same problem, to the same target group. The target group who does not want pee in pants. That target group. Same okay. kind of pee, basically. Same yeah. chemical. Again, I mean, I was also in the work group and uh, some other people here. And we questioned this direction. We said, no, this, this won't do. I mean, we can't go this way because this is just, just feels wrong. Uh, 
Okay, back to the ads. Um, to the left, I see a uh, person who is strong, capable, cool, in control. To the right, I see someone who is probably less in control. Uh, passive, I would say passive. Passive and active, woman, man. That's, that's what I see here. Mm. And one would, one would imagine, I did at least, yeah. going into this project, that because uh, we saw the, the amounts of money it just poured right. into a big account like this. Mm -hmm. That's like millions of millions of dollars. There were like marketing directors flown in from Boston to Gothenburg. So much money. So one would guess, I did at first, that <laughs> there must be some extensive research done here on the target group, like a, a proper like research, who are they, what does their lives look like, mm -hmm. what do they need, what kind of challenges do they face, right, Kaisa? Sorry to say that's not the case in this uh, situation no here. No, 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 it was just a matter of uh, marketing directors having a gut feeling uh, that some people like florals and giggles and some people like ice cool, being strong and cool stuff. Yep. Okay, so that good old gut feeling. Yeah. That good old gut feeling results in messages like this that's being pushed out into the world that is basically saying that people of a certain gender are in control. People of a certain gender uh, are not. That's, they, advertising is dangerous, kids. It is. Mm. A funny story about this project as well was that uh, we learned that some people don't even pee pee. What? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Because as a copywriter, I was, <laughs> I was given some, a few prohibitions uh, uh, in my writing. When I wrote for the female target audience, I was not allowed to use certain words, such as pee, urine and incontinence, because those words were too disturbing. They were not disturbing when I wrote for the male audience, but they were disturbing towards the female audience. And I questioned, again, we did a, few, we did a bit of questioning in this mm -hmm. project. Uh, and I questioned this because they wanted me to use words like leaks or leakage instead. And being in the target audience, I had a hard time relating to that. It felt like they talked about me as if I was some sort of a tap <laughs> that wasn't like screwed on, was just <laughs> happening to me. I had no... Uh, and also, like from a search point of view, I mean, let's say that I have herpes. I might not enjoy having herpes, but I'm still going to Google herpes to find some sort of a relief for said herpes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to Google leaks, unless I want to make a leak dish. Um, <laughs> or oops moment, which was another thing they wanted me to call it. Anyway, this was so... <laughs> This was, talk about disturbing to us, I mean, to me, I ended up having a hard time getting out of bed in the morning to actually go to this workplace and be a part of sending these messages out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, I, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I was really sad for a while. Mm. And uh, I was just happy to see that you felt the same way. <laughs> I did, I did. Uh, yeah, it was a totally awkward time, so we quit. We, we, yeah. <laughs> and now we're on this stage, tabooing the hell out of ourselves. So yeah, <laughs> water under yeah. the bridge and stuff. We have a lot of taboo breaking to catch up yeah. after those years. <laughs> of, yeah. Uh, we've been talking a long time now, but we want to summarize this talk uh, by saying that uh, taboo is not a one person's problem. It's connected to something much, much bigger than that. It has to do with politics and norms and how we treat each other. Um, taboo is about whose voice is being heard and who gets to be on stage and what's worth saying. Taboo is about who gets to live their life carefree, not worrying about stuff. And it's also about those who have to live their life suffering from stuff like anal pockets and more. Uh, I mean, 
we as creatives, you as creatives, uh, believe that we have a responsibility. Yeah, we, uh, if it's one thing we want to like pass along now that we are on a stage talking to people, we, we, it is that if you do anything creative, and as Krista said, everyone's creative, so we all do something. We feel that it's really important to at least acknowledge that what we do affects people. And no matter the target group, big or small, what we send out there, imagery, words, art, it is going to affect people and in some way perhaps uh, change the way they see the world. And it's going to affect how they look at normality, what is normal and what is not, what fits, what does not fit. So we want to just say that if you create anything, please allow yourselves time to think long and hard before you start creating. And then as you go along creating, always stop more than you think to just question why you do it. Right. That's all for us. If you want to get in touch, find us on the internet. Thank you. Thank you.